Okay, here we are. Uh, this is our first um, broadcast. We're, we're, we're talking about eldership. This is an uh, eldership group at Pathway Church, and uh, we decided this would be something that uh, maybe we could benefit from and others could as well uh, as the conversation goes on. And we're going to start out talking about the, um, the book, They Smell Like Sheep, by Dr. Lynn Anderson, and kind of hit little thoughts on chapter one. Uh, do you guys want to introduce yourselves? Well, let's do that. Don't, I mean, don't, don't you know, get into big biography, but just who are you? Who, why would anybody care? You know, and because uh, we're not experts, we're not coming in and saying we know everything, but we're on a journey together with whoever else might watch these and uh, talking about eldership. So we'll start with Brian and kind of go around. How's that? I'll set the tone. Uh, yeah, Brian Freeman. Uh, been at Pathway for about almost 13 years. Hard to believe. Um, lived in L.A. before I moved here back to Iowa, and really. Just love this church. I think we got a great congregation. Um, yeah, real excited about tonight. Yeah, I am uh, Rodney. Uh, I've been with the church uh, since about the first uh, month. Uh, so I've seen uh, Pathway Church grow from a small handful of people uh, up to uh, what it is uh, now. And I've been on uh, the leadership and or eldership team for, oh gosh, at least five Four or five years, I can't even remember been anymore. <laughs> so it's it's been a long time. So, um, yeah. Well, I'm Brandon Vavercheck. Uh, s- helped start Pathway um, back in the hotel days. Um, been here the whole time. Had a couple stints of moves between here and there. So San Antonio, San Antonio Lincoln, Nebraska. So. Came back to the promised land. Yeah, he always found his way back home. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> miss, miss that cold weather. Oops. That prodigal child. <laughs> Shorts all year round in San Antonio. Um, I'm Roger Howard. And Roger. I, I've been here for a couple years. Uh, well, I was here for a couple years back from like 2003 to 2005. And then uh, went to Sioux City and came back in the last couple of years. And a uh, small group leader. Um, we had like to get together every single week and Brian and I are new elders of the church and we're just ready to serve. Excellent. Okay, a little context uh, because something that uh, nobody knows, right? I mean, uh, we're a church that started in 2002. This is 2016, the end of 2016. Uh, So that makes us, what, 14 years old? Uh, Started like many churches, a small group. We had a leadership team in the beginning. We did not call them elders uh, because we wanted to give the church and them time to, to grow and develop and actually took our time before we started calling people elders because there's a lot of baggage that comes with that. There's a lot of uh, good, bad, in between, whatever, the kind of stuff we'll be talking about over the next few weeks. And we just wanted to make sure, I, we probably took too much time, to be honest, because uh, it's not like we didn't have quality people. We, we just, I don't know, we just waited. We just waited, right? Um, and uh, we put a lot of prayer in, into eldership uh, before we even talk about people becoming on the leadership team or becoming elders. Uh, so we don't take this lightly. It's a very uh, extremely important uh, ministry within the church and within scripture. And so our first elders, when did we come, become elders? Was it two, three years ago? Two or three years ago, yeah. When yeah, we probably. officially declared a transition from leadership team to pastoral team eldership. Um, so anyway, that gives us some context. So, we're, so that's why I say this is new. We're on a journey as, as a church and as individuals uh, going forward. Because had any of you been elders prior? Negative. No, no. I mean, I'm kind of assuming. I'm like the old guy now, which is really weird. I'm used to always <laughs> being the young guy, and um, um, yeah. So it's just it's even a transition for me mentally, uh, being like, oh wow, that's, that's a different thing being older. <laughs> um, so anyway, that's where we're at. They smell like sheep. Uh, great book. Uh, one really the first one as this team is uh, prepared or talk, you know as we are as a team. The first time we're going through a book, and this is the one we're going through. Uh, to begin, they smell like sheep. What do you guys think? Chapter one talks a lot about sh- shepherding. Well, I think, I mean, I think the concept makes a lot of sense. Um, it, so maybe it's the time of year, I guess, but it seems like a lot of people are hurting this time of year. Um, there's a lot of uh, that financial stress. There's a lot of um, relationship stress with family. Um, families can be difficult, obviously. People who have lost loved ones. Um, and it seems like uh, in the church setting at times, it's it's hard to connect with people. And um, 
sometimes it's because you're not rubbing shoulders with people like you should be. You're not getting to know them. You're not spending time with them. And, and I think that's what struck me. Um, the first part of the book here, first part of the chapter, I guess, is just talking about how the shepherd interacts with the sheep and um, how they protect them, how they, you know, they feed, they water, just all the time they spend with them. And I think I try to relate that back to, well, what kind of time do I spend with people or what kind of relationships do I have with people? Um, you know, you hear something that goes on in the church and you think, well, one, do you even know that person? And then two, do you know them well enough to know if you would even, if they would approach you or if you'd, if you'd you know, be able to rate, really relate enough to them. So that's kind of what struck me just in the beginning. Yeah. I, uh, yeah, totally agree with all that. I, I The very first page, um, the author describes how he was explaining this analogy of, of a shepherd and his sheep um, to some different people, and some of them are saying, well, this is, this is not a modern analogy. I don't understand it. I don't know about you guys. I don't think it's that hard of an analogy to understand. Uh, it, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, look, um, we all understand what it means. It, it's someone who is in charge of a flock, uh, someone who is is maybe more of a cowboy. They're not. They're not. Uh, you know, it's not an authoritarian kind of relationship. It's a caring relationship. It's an overseeing relationship, a mentoring relationship. Um, I think it's pretty easy to understand, even in the 21st century. And I think some too. You know, people maybe not from the Midwest or an agricultural community. You know, depending on how urbanized they are. You know, I could see in the book it mentions. Um, you know, some guys didn't think the shepherding analogy would work in the modern era, but, you know, as the author goes through and basically describes what the shepherd does, I mean, it totally makes sense. There's there's no modern equivalent to it. So, you yeah, know, yeah. I think, you know, he comes to the right conclusion in that, you know, we just need to do a job, a better job of explaining what it means to be a shepherd and what the context mm-hmm. is. And I think people will get it. People are bright. They they aren't going to, you know, be able to not grasp a concept of someone who is basically the, the be-all, end-all for the sheep. I mean, the sheep are literally lost and would die without the shepherd. And, you know, he is there to take care of them, to nurture them, and to lead them. And they know who he is by his voice, which, you know, is very, you know, cool to see, uh, you know, the example he describes in the book where, you know, these shep- shepherds are walking down a trail together, their sheep are all intermixed. One goes down one trail, one goes down another, and a third goes down the other trail. They hoop and holler, and their sheep follow them. Mm-hmm. Or even, some of them even follow them without ho- the hooping and hollering, but they call their lost or strayed sheep just by making, you know, their their typical sound, which is just it's, it's uncanny. It's at the mall, I'm not going to lie to you. <laughs> yeah. You know, it, it you, what? You get into a shopping center at the mall and... Oh. You don't know where your kids are, you know. Lily, there they are. That is <laughs> right. <now. laughs> so okay, what what? Are, I mean, he he's right. There's no modern word. You know, you think of what are some words you might try to throw in? You know, coach, mentor, mentor. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I don't know what do you guys. I mean, leader. Yeah, leader, leader. Um, Shepherd. I think cowboy works. I mean, uh, th- that's a modern equivalent. I think we can understand. Yeah, at least an American. Yeah, exactly. You know, we get that. Yeah, I yeah, mean, yeah. Look, you know. So, are we saying everybody's cows now? Are we? Are we, are we <laughs> Is that better than sheep? I don't, I, I don't know. You don't shear a cow. Maybe that's better. I don't a little less work. <laughs> yeah, I do prefer steak. A cow's a little bit more self-sufficient, fortunately. Well, okay, so we'll go back to sheep. Okay, right. All right. But I will say this: when I worked in LA, I had a coworker. And um, I won't name her, but she was a staunch atheist. And she remarked quite a bit about how uh, she had been brought up both Mormon and Jewish. And she, she despised both religions. And uh, she knew I was a Christian. And she would talk about the analogy of being a sheep and how awful it was. She, she despised the analogy of being a sheep. She, she thought it was the lowest form of intelligence and this and that. I think that's a challenge we have as maybe elders to to explain this analogy to say, look, we don't think that our congregation are, are dumb or, or or aimless or anything like that. I think it's more about the shepherd. It's not about the, she- the sheep. I, uh, maybe that's a, a bad way to say it, but I don't know. Do you guys, do you guys see what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I do. I think, I mean, 
the sheep are viewed are viewed as weak, I think, mm-hmm. in society because they are dumb. And but I think if from reading the book and and also if you knew what a what a shepherd actually does, mm-hmm. that's not that's not the case or that's not the true picture. But I think you're right. I think I can see how people could see that. Well, and I, I I wonder too if you know we're we're looking at domesticated sheep. Um, there had to be something, you know, before she became domesticated that they had to have some intelligence in order to survive. I mean, even, you know, evolutionists believe that there was, you know, if you if you weren't able to survive, you died out and, you know, right. you, you didn't, you ceased to exist. Survival of the fittest. Well, you know, there had to be some changing, you know, there had to be some leadership or something where the sheep had enough intelligence to be able to live. And, you know, you look at wild sheep you know like you know the big horn sheep or something like that you know granted they're probably distantly related or something but you know there had to be something with the domestic domestication of the sheep that changed that you know your selective traits for sheep that are docile and that will follow and you know yeah so, so we yeah. need to select for a congregation that could be milked oh you yeah. sure i don't know okay <laughs> and provide wool <laughs> Not sure where he's going with that, yeah. but, you know. Well, I'm just trying to say that there's some inher- inherent intelligence in sheep somewhere. <coughs> well, you look on uh, so page number 22, it says, A flocks naturally gather around food, protection, affection, mm-hmm. touch, and voice. Mm-hmm. I mean, you think about that from what the, the nature of sheep and what they... I don't think the, the, the shepherd necessarily has a, um, like a dominant um, disposition over the sheep, I think, because he loves and cares for his sheep and... He even goes, keeps on uh, talking about uh, the shepherd. They serve the sheep. They feed the water, protect the sheep. They touch and talk to the sheep. They even lay down their lives for the sheep. And in essence, that's what we're talking. The book's called They Smell Like Sheep. Biblical shepherds actually smell like sheep. So being, being I think that's I think their that's lives. the image we need to cling to, not this mm-hmm. idea that sheep are aimless, dumb animals. It's It's the concept that sheep need protection. They need... They need help. They need to be around others. I like that. I like going down that path. Yeah, they need love and affection and care, yeah. you know, to to thrive. This is natural human nature. Right, right. right. And they say we all need we all need exactly. that. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so as as elders, we're called to, to be that shepherd who provides the things we're talking about. But but putting on the hat that says elder doesn't make it happen. No. You know. So right. so, so right. what's what's the secret? How how, how do we get? Because because they are real people. They're not just sheep, you know. They're, they're, and and there are people like uh, your friend uh, in California who who would be like offended at the, the idea of being. What do you mean? I'm sheep, you know. I'm I'm I don't need any of this. So how how do you get to the point where they will accept uh, the things that you you mentioned, Roger, um, that the affection and the things then that that they need uh, from an elder? Well, I think uh, as an elder, we need to be hands on. We need to be personal. We need to develop relationships and spend time with the flock to be open and honest and transparent with our sheep or our uh, you know our congregation um, to let them know who we are that we're not perfect um, and get to know them on a personal level um, I think that's where small groups come in too I think in that setting you, you get to know people on a more intimate um, setting instead of just on Sunday mornings hey how you doing oh great you know See you next week, kind of a thing. Right. And you got people inside your house, inside your home. You pray together. You're sharing life together. The kids come over. Um, they're playing together. Um, yeah, we're just growing and get to know each other and learning more about Christ and how to be um, Christ to people on the outside. So I think that's how we we put the hat on the the elder hat. We actually um, spend time with our our sheep. Exactly. The, the the book mentions three things uh, mm-hmm. that we need to do to to build relationships, and and you know putting on that hat alone isn't isn't going to make it. But um, that relationships require availability, uh, and that's where you're, you're talking your small groups, and and any times you're with someone, you're getting to know them. Uh, you can only go that so far on a Sunday morning with a hello, a friendly handshake. Um, you're, you're not into their life story. You don't know what kept them awake last week. You don't know the stresses in their life mm-hmm. without spending time with them. Um, relationships require commitment that you're really you know there for them, and, and they require trust. Trust um, mm-hmm. 
those are things you build. Um, and, and, pr and probably one of the, the pitfalls where, where I think, you know, I'm, I'm assuming other elders will be listening to this saying, hey, we're going to get some ideas, is, is uh, people understand, well, why won't they tell me things? Why, why won't people tell me they have need? Well, they're not going to do it until they trust you, right? I mean, they're not just, just, just right. because, hey, I'm an elder now in the congregation. Hey, I'm an elder. elder. Um, they got to get to know you, and, and that invest takes an investment of time. Yeah, yeah, very few people will come to you just based on what your title is. You right. Know, you have to earn it. Right, so definitely. How do you earn it? Well, and, and that's just <laughs> basically it. You have to be out there with them. You have to be rubbing elbows with them. You have to be doing life with them. Mm -hmm. So that way that they know that you're you're trustworthy, you're interacting with them, you're building the relationship. Yeah. And that's really where it comes down to now. Is that the easiest thing to do for all of us? Probably not. You know, no. definitely I would be one that's like, yeah, I'm a little bit more of that, you know, timid, mm -hmm. reserved kind of personality, but, you know, you really have to practice yeah. getting out there and talking to people. And, you know, sometimes it's, a, you know, people's conversation lasts 30 seconds and they move on. Sometimes you're 20 minutes and you didn't get to talk to anybody else, but maybe you made a good connection with that person that, you know, you've seen for the first time that came through the door. And yeah. And, and you build so, on that with the next 20-second conversation. Right. That becomes a 30-second one. Or it becomes a 20-minute or 30-minute late-for-service <laughs> kind, of, kind of deal. So. Yeah, yeah. And I think one of the hardest things for me is when somebody shares something with me and doing doing the follow-up. Like, hey, you, we, we, the, I'm praying for um, your sheep. And then when they tell you about something in their life and then trying to follow up with that instead of letting it go. You know, right. Because gives you maybe your 30 second conversation is going to go into a another 30 seconds mm -hmm. so yeah yeah so you have a 30 second conversation and then and the next week uh, the follow-up maybe be if, if you're waiting a week till you see them um hey how how is that going which can lead to they're like saying hey they actually listen to me mm -hmm. people people know if you're listening to them or not you know yeah. um you actually paid attention to what, what i said um, yeah i think the struggle for me is time that I have to spend right. with the congregation. <laughs> Excuse me. <coughs> that was unplanned. Um, <laughs> I, I think the struggle I have is that 98% of the people I see at church I see on Sunday, and I right. only see them on Sunday morning. I would love to make that different, um, but I'm like probably every other guy in this room. I have a job. Um, uh, you know, I spend a lot of my time away from the church, um, I have kids in activities, and I don't I don't um, have a lot of time at you know during the week to spend with them. So I'm trying to establish this relationship. Maybe the question is for for you guys is how do you how do you try and build a relationship that sometimes is only a two hour a week relationship? How does that work? Yeah, it's tough. <laughs> it's tough to get it's tough to get real with people in in two minutes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. You know that's the, that's the hard thing of. The conversation beyond how's your week and you say good and fine and mm -hmm. you know now if you're lucky and you're one of those elders that might be listening to the show or or um at an at another church you might hang out with people from your congregation almost daily right maybe you work with them yeah um maybe you have a youth group with them or that sort of thing but i have a feeling that the majority is people like us mm -hmm. that don't see most of our congregation most of the time and, and that was true in the New Testament too. That there, there were some. That's how paid staff kind of began. Was we're going to pay one guy so, so he doesn't have to work and he can kind of hang out with mm -hmm. people. And I think that's the importance of a plurality, plurality mm -hmm. uh, of elders. Is none of us can do everything, right. but together we can hit a lot. Um, yeah. So you're building relationship with some, and you're building some, you know, with other mm -hmm. people. And everybody's got kind of our eyes. Uh, the picture of an elder is a, a, a guy on a hill looking down over the sheep, you know, so we're kind of keeping our eyes on everything, mm -hmm. looking for red flags and building relationships. And, yeah, it's too much to expect for, for like, any one of us to know everybody. Um, but even, like, Moses was told, hey, break them into groups and mm -hmm. put people over them and smaller groups and smaller groups. And, and uh, so that's what we try to do. We have small groups mm -hmm. and we have, you know, uh, elders. Um kind of two tiers so that everybody's needs are met somehow but but you know we're still fleshing some of that stuff out too um it's always evolving i think in a church uh, yeah and i think that you know you hit the the nail on the head with the way, what talking about moses how you know they had the 12 tribes and then they had 
separation, you know, some leaders over those, and then there was leaders out of smaller groups and smaller but groups. But it didn't start that way. Remember, no. he started yeah. by being a micromanager overachiever, and he tried to meet with everyone in his tent, and his, I think it was Jethro had to come to him, right? And say, was, it, was it Aaron or Jethro? Yeah, it was, it was Jethro. One of, was it Jethro? It was Jeth- mm-hmm. yeah. You're doing way too much, dude. Yeah. you got to delegate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jeth- yeah. Right? yeah, yeah. 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 Father-in-law, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. have your 50,000, and you're, you know, you break it yes. down, and yep. Absolutely. Yeah, so we have, you know, good biblical examples of, hey, that, you know, doesn't work to manage them all. Yeah. Because then you, you're not connected to anybody. And, you know, we're going to have our, our spheres of influence in different sections in, in the church. And we just, you know, do, need to do our best to make sure that there's someone that's doing the role of, of ministering to people that, you know, may not be in the, the, the groups, the small groups that the elders are in. But I think, you know, we may need to do a better job of, you know, helping to um, come come uh, with other people who are who are filling that role yeah. and making sure that they're getting what they need to do that role. So, you know, that's more things we need to kind of uh, flush out a little bit and, and see where we need to improve. I, I will say that I liked where the author said, you can tell a shepherd because he already has a flock. Yeah. I think that is totally yep. true. Yeah. I've seen it, right? So in my Sunday school class, I've had people that have come to that class for years, right? Um, others of you have had uh, certain ministries. Maybe it's cafe. Maybe it's teaching uh, Sunday school, um, uh, finances, whatever. There's already people that, that work with you regularly. They're kind of your flock already, yeah. right? Yeah. I think that helps. That, that, that's one of the things we, like, in, in looking for future elders, mm-hmm. it's mm-hmm. one of our criteria is, are they already elding? Yes. Right. You know, it's not like <laughs> we'll call them one and now there will be one. It's like, no, they, they've got to be one first. If they have a flock, then, mm-hmm. then they're an elder. You know, whether we call them or not, it doesn't matter what we call them. Um, and that, that's definitely been part of And which was another reason why we waited so long is we wanted the, that, that develop and, and, and grow and be organic. Um, I, I've seen churches uh, try to figure out, this is the age-old thing, how do we meet the needs of everybody, right? Um, I've seen churches divide the eldership and the congregation like alphabetically <laughs> you know you take these you take those and i don't know if i've ever heard of a church where that works i mean because it, it, it's like what if you're with someone who you don't naturally get along with but see that's that well? it you'll just naturally sort with people that get along with you and exactly trust you, right you can't mm-hmm. force it yeah yeah and that's where i think the plurality again is, is helpful because we all have different personalities we're going to reach mm-hmm. different people and connect with different people um and, and so i think a lot of it's just keeping the radar on mm-hmm. it our eyes are always looking. Yeah. And that, that's probably one thing that holding that hat officially does is it really opens your eyes um, to like, okay, now I'm intentional. And, and I think it takes a lot of intentionality mm-hmm. to be available, that commitment, to build trust um, that uh, he talks about here in chapter one. So, you know, On the very last page, um, the very last um, sentence actually, it says, when godly, loving, gentle shepherds first build authentic relationships with their flocks, then rise up and lead out hungry sheep or sheep hungry for biblical leadership and wise guidance will willingly follow. Hmm. So looking for those people who are natural leaders yep. or already elding people. Uh, that, that, and that authentic thing is huge. Yeah. You just can't force it. I think it uh, to be genuine with uh, those people that you're leading is very, very important. Again, let them know that we're not perfect. We're, we're trying mm-hmm. to make it right. through this life just like you are. I want to be better for Christ. I want to reach other people for Christ. I want my house to be that light on the hill. Yep. And I don't have it all together. And I need to have the small group just as much as you do. So, mm, Right. Yeah. Anything else? Anything else stick out in this chapter to you guys? Or just thoughts? As we... Well, you know, was it Jer- the uh, portion in there about Jeremiah where they're talking about leaders who are leading their flocks astray mm-hmm. and, and what the... Um, the consequences are for those i mean that was a little little unsettling i yeah. mean yeah. you know you got to make sure that you're you're taking your people the way that uh the bible and god is telling you to take them because yeah. you will be held to an account for that um mm-hmm. so you know that was a little bit of a ponder moment you know it's like you know make sure that you know you are being true and faithful so and in, uh, in James 3, 1, it says we, we're going to be judged more strictly yeah. uh, because of who we are. You know, if we're called to be elders and we're, we accept that role to be an elder, then it's game on. 
Yeah. Do you guys feel like after you became elders, your your life changed in that way? Do you feel like you started holding yourself to a higher standard? I'm just curious. I do. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think, and I think there's those times where you question whatever it is, whether it's your prayer life or, um, you know, how active you are or the relationships you're making, you question, um, am I doing enough? Am I doing the right things? Am I listening to what God actually wants me to do? I think that's something I struggle with at times where I'm like, you know, I feel like I'm, I'm not, I don't feel like I'm making progress. I don't know what progress looks like sometimes, but you just don't feel like you're doing something or, or maybe am I doing enough or am I listening enough? I think that comes, that comes up for me quite a bit. Where even though, um, you know, I feel I feel like I'm solid in my faith, you know, and I'm I'm good with God, but am I good enough? And, and, and you know, I'm in this role and taking this leadership role. Am I doing enough? Am I doing what God actually wants me to do? And I think that's something that um, I question and kind of overanalyze. That's my personality, and to just definitely overanalyze. But I also think it keeps me on my feet a little bit more than say be pre being an elder role mm-hmm. where, mm-hmm. you know, I might not have thought about it very often of, yeah. you know, I, I think as a Christian, you, you, you know, you should be doing some things. You don't have to have an elder hat on to be, um, building relationships with people and, and forming bonds with people and helping people. And you should be doing that anyway. But, um, I do feel like it's ramped up a bit once you put that hat on. Now in the book, it talks about, you know, as leaders, we're the ones that were responsible for the spiritual well, well-being of this church of this congregation and that, that's a that's a big charge that's a heavy heavy charge to be be an elder of a church I mean when you accept that responsibility I think it's important to understand what exactly that means and it says today's leaders carry the life and death responsibility for their people just as the prophets priests and kings of old did hmm. and we need to make sure that we are spot on and that's important for us too um, to continually grow in our, our, our walk in our faith and as iron sharpens iron, keep each other accountable. I told you guys this before, and I was, I was kind of open and honest. When I'm at work, I put my uniform on, I'm on, game on, and there's nothing you can do to stop me. I'm just going to go, go, go. But when I take my uniform off, I'm, I'm home for the weekend or home at night, I kind of let my hair down a little bit. And it's like, oh, just no more responsibility today. Just I just want to veg That's out. a funny analogy, Roger. I, I well, like that. As we're seeing the, the shaved head. Oh, yeah, like that. <laughs> but the same thing when I came to church. I wasn't an elder role. I'll be like, oh, I just, I just want to be a consumer right now. I just want to listen to the word. I want to sing some songs, and then talk to a few people, and then go to lunch, and then um, that kind of shaped my attitude a little bit. Because when I'm at work, it's like I flip a switch and I'm, I'm on. But now that I've accepted an elder role, when I come to, it's when I step in the doors. I'm an elder. Game on. And it's I have to be mindful of that all the time. Yeah, and that's one thing too. As uh, I've been a lot more intentional about making sure that I try to talk to someone that I haven't mm-hmm. talked to before, yeah. um, try to introduce myself uh, to people that you know are new that or people that I haven't met uh, or don't know very well. Um, yeah, and you know that's something that is I have to push myself out of my comfort zone, but it's definitely something I've done more. You know, I think since before we I was called an elder, it to an elder, I, I knew maybe twenty percent of the congregation. I'm I'm not kidding. Twenty to thirty percent of the congregation. Uh-huh. I like I said, I surrounded myself with the people in my class and and my my brother-in-law and 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 a few other folks. That was it. Uh, yeah. Definitely, that's been my biggest challenge area is yeah. learning names, meeting new people. Mm-hmm. You know, I like doing it. It's just it wasn't a priority before. I think it's right, really important right. now, obviously. Yeah. So well, and I think we. I think Dan, you mentioned earlier about everybody has their 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 skills or their talents mm-hmm. or their personality that you're going to click with, and I think your circle is only going to be so big, but I think it is important to touch base with as many as you can because you don't know who you're going to pull in, who you're going to connect with. And some people you talk to and you don't have a connection and some people you do. And I think that's why it is important for everybody to get out and touch base and pull your circle in, Mm -hmm. into your circle. Definitely. Okay. It's kind of time to wrap it up. Um, One thing we didn't do, I don't think we talked about what we do for a living um, just because (laughs) Well, I mean, because you mentioned your job, I thought you know, there's people. There people are watching that. It's like it, it, it's just it's just be an interesting thing for people to know. You you guys are all in professions, right? You're but you're all very different in different professions, um, and it just I think it's just a good thing for people 
uh, to, to be a, to, to know where they're going. So we'll go reverse order. <laughs> reverse. All right. Roger. All right. I am in the military. I've been in the military in some form or fashion for about 25 years now. Um, I have started off in the Navy. I was in prior enlisted. I was enlisted for, oh my goodness, probably 14 years and got a commission back in 2006. And I'm rising the ranks. And I'm a commander now at the 132nd Wing. I'm a, the security forces commander and anti-terrorism officer. So I'm in charge of all security and anti-terrorism related uh, stuff at the, the wing. I'm the wing commander and his leadership team's um, advisor for force protection. So that's what I do on a day-to-day -day <coughs> basis. Excellent. So, Brandon. Uh, well, I am in insurance. So i um, probably been in insurance for Gosh, I don't know. Um, I've been with, I'm working nationwide. I've been with nationwide uh, almost 15 years. So spent um, a ton of time in like a supervisor type role um, over different areas and moved with the company a couple times. Um, currently, I'm still still on the insurance side of things and work in the agribusiness area, um, commercial insurance. So um, much more spreadsheet uh type of role today so individual to contributor type role today which is much different for me so than mm, what it's yeah. been yeah. yeah Rodney uh, I'm a physical therapist um, been doing that for over 13 years now um, you know have seen my career you know go from a working at a small clinic and now to a large um, hospital that's actually the one the fifth largest uh, aff accountable care organization in the country um, so, you know, it's a huge organization, um, and I'm, you know, looking towards, you know, uh, moving up in the ranks into more of a leadership role in that area as well. So, um, yeah. Excellent. Got yeah. a sore elbow. We got to work on that, buddy. Uh, yeah, I, it's right you know, here. I'll get you get my card. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be funny if you were wearing a sling while you were telling us all about <laughs> Yeah, right. <laughs> 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 yeah. Uh, okay, so Brian Freeman, I work for DuPont Pioneer, which is an ag biotech seed company um, headquartered here in Johnston. Um, so uh, I lead business intelligence for research at Pioneer, and this is basically uh, reporting. I have a team of software uh, specialists and um, analysts who develop uh, reporting software for research. Um, my background is I was trained as a scientist, but I also worked as an artist in Los Angeles for eight years. So a bit of a bit of a varied background um, and uh, yeah so excellent excellent and uh, I, I'm uh, I'm the guy who came and planted the church I've been a pastor for 32 years and um, uh, love doing it and, and let me say my my um, uh, this has been uh, a, a, a pure joy for me the last few months because um, it was creating this 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 baby pathway church. Uh, you know, I mean, God did it obviously, but you know, He uses people, right? So, so we came and planted this church. And one of my biggest concerns over the past ten years has been if I get hit by an ice cream truck, I, I didn't know. I was afraid for the future. Um, uh, I knew it's God's church; it's He'll worry about it. But I just thought I, I don't know. I mean, I just don't know. And uh, with this current group of of eldership, um, what the last three months or so, whatever it's been, uh, I go home every night now, and I think to myself, if I get hit by an ice cream truck, it doesn't matter. I mean, you know, I mean, this church will be just fine, um, and and you'll get a nice financial uh, gift probably. So it's a win-win <laughs> <laughs> until I get too old and the insurance rates go up. But uh, yeah. <laughs> anyway, it, I guess that, I mean that truly. Uh, I, I love you guys, and uh, I love this team. And um, I, I, um, I just like, uh, it's just gonna sound stupid. I get like warm fuzzies every time I think about this, this group. And, and we're, in the be we're just starting. Room's hot. <laughs> Very warm in here. <laughs> I'm working for some, some free work from Rodney, so. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, it, it, we, we just, I think we complement each other really well. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it's just a good thing. So I'm looking forward, going forward, what this looks like, this vodcast. Um, who knows? We might look back in six months, and be really embarrassed at this thing. Um, <laughs> on the technical side, I'm sure we will be because I'm running the sound <laughs> and stuff, and this is all new uh, on the engineer side for me. But anyway, we'll wrap this up, and uh, we plan to do this about once a month or so, and we'll go from there.